Before we get into what the text is for today, we have a little quiz for you, so hopefully you studied, but uh, I copied the text straight from the ESV up on the screens here, and your quiz is, point to verse 14. You see it? Yeah, if you're looking at your ESV in front of you, you'll notice also it's not there. Some of you may have different translations, and you may have it in brackets or parentheses or a little note there. What in the world's going on? I mean, I'm pretty good at math. I'm pretty sure I remember that there's a number between 13 and 15 when you're counting. What happened? Did somebody change it? Did somebody take something out? Like who, who put something in that they had to take out? Was there a mistake? When you see something like this, it might cause you to think, is the Bible trustworthy? Okay, so let's talk about where Verse 14 is, first of all, specifically, but the bigger question is, can we trust the Bible? Is, is it trustworthy? Because people will try to attack the Bible all the time and say it's full of errors, there's been some tons of changes and discrepancies, contradictions. Well, let's talk about this and defense against that, thinking how, how we can defend ourselves and defend the Bible um, against attacks like that. First of all, God did not ordain that his word would be transmitted by a generational game of telephone throughout hundreds of years. Like we just tell people and they tell people and it just goes that way. He actually ordained that it would be written down. We have letters that people wrote from one per people to another people. We have uh, texts, of research, it's a research paper that people wrote and gathered all this information. They wrote it down and immediately after they wrote it down, people, other believers, began to copy them by hand. They would take the letters, they would take the manuscripts, and they would copy them diligently, specifically, take, meticulously copy them. And that started from the very beginning. That's how he chose to transmit his word in a written form. It was copied by hand. The New Testament was copied by hand for hundreds of years until 1455 when the printing press was invented. Then they could make it the same all the time, which changed everything. In the 1500s, William Tyndale, you may have heard that name, he took the available manuscripts from the Hebrew and the Greek and he actually made an English translation straight from the Hebrew and Greek with the manuscripts he had available. This was revolutionary. That paved the way for what we know as the King James translation in 1611. What that also did, not only was it a, the first really standardized English translation, but it standardized the verse numbers. They had, but before then, there was not verse numbers. I mean, Paul didn't sit down when he's writing his letter and insert verse numbers and chapters. He just wrote a letter. Over the course of time, they thought it'd be more helpful if we knew which verses and sections we're talking about. So there was a number of different systems that they came up with, but they kind of settled on one when they did the King James. And that's the number system we use today. Well, what happened, I mean, that was 1611, over 400 years ago. Since that time, we discovered thousands more manuscripts that are, we have more of them, and older ones that are closer to the original. And so sometimes, as you're comparing all these different manuscripts, you find out, wait a second, there's some things that are in the older manuscripts that don't line up with what we have in the later manuscripts. And that's what happens here. They, they did research, they found what they think is a well-meaning scribe at one point as he was copying, thought of these verses in Mark and Luke and said that would go here really nicely. And, but they can go through all these different uh, manuscripts and see when it was added. That's why your Bible says, either it says this is not in the earliest manuscripts or they take it out altogether. Now the reason that they didn't renumber then from there is obviously that would cause chaos. Then your Bible version is verse this and that's a different verse in another Bible. So they kept the overall number system but the ESV chose to just remove verse 14. And that's where verse 14 went. Okay, so how, you may be wondering how many of these verses appear in the ESV New Testament. There's actually only 18 of these sections out of 7,958 verses. So it's a whopping 0.2% of the Bible. So it's not like it's widespread throughout your Bible, but there are places where this little note appears. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper here because we have to talk about how we can, how we can trust this text because sometimes people will say, look, this is a popular one if you've ever heard this. The, the New Testament has 400,000 word variants. Now, if you're not familiar with what's going on and you hear that, you think, whoa, what does that mean? You mean mistakes? You mean errors? 400,000? That seems like a lot. Well, that's why they try to use that number. The reality is, if you take a breath, call me if you have to, if you're like, I forget what it was. What it was. 99% of those 400,000 are simple either spelling errors where different regions had different spellings for words, or it could be some sort of arrangement or punctuation or grammar, or 
Sometimes it was just a slip of a pen that made a little mark that wasn't supposed to be there, and they call that a variant. 99% can be dismissed as that. It doesn't change anything about the word. Of the last 1%, half of those are not viable enough to consider it debatable. Only half a percent are even debatable, up for debate. The consensus among text-critical scholars, which is people who spend their lives studying the text of the Bible, the consensus is that the Bible is 99.5% textually pure and 100% theologically pure. What does that mean? None of these variants have any effect on any material issue, historical fact, or doctrinal position. And this is not an issue of faith. It's not like just the Christians are over here saying, yeah, it doesn't affect the Bible, so don't worry about it. It's these, some people who study the Bible aren't even, they don't even believe in God. They're just studying the actual facts, the manuscripts and the texts. And they come to consensus saying it's 99.5%, we can be, we can be 99.5% sure in the purity of the text. And the, those, that small portion is debatable, but not affect any sort of uh, material issue, historical fact, or doctrinal position. Now, how do we get there? How can we have a little confidence that, we're, that we can land at that number? Well, we evaluate the New Testament just like we do any other ancient Greek text. And this is how everyone does it. So I have a chart up here, and it's going to show you uh, works from Plato, Caesar, Tacitus, Aristotle, Sophocles. All these guys are accepted across the board in academia. I mean, you read these guys, and they, they consider these to be reliable works. These are what these guys actually wrote. Well, you have in this chart is when they actually lived and when they wrote these, supposedly, and then the earliest copy that we have of that work. But then you see how much space there is. A thousand years, sometimes 1,400 years between when they wrote it and the first copy that we have. That's a long time for something to happen to that material. And yet, it's accepted as being relevant and real and genuine. We have a, another work by Homer that we have a lot more uh, evidence for. That's he wrote that in 900 B.C., and we have a copy that dates to 400 B.C., which is within 500 years, about a half of that time. So you move way closer to the original, plus you have hundreds more manuscripts, which you can compare them and find out what's closest to the original. That's a ton better than the previous list. But all of these guys are considered, without question, to be accepted in academia. I'm building up to something, aren't I? I feel like it's a game show. Are you ready? I'm gonna, okay, survey says, New Testament. Let's look at these numbers. We have several copies, manuscript copies of the New Testament within 100 years of when it was written. In fact, there's a fragment from the Gospel of John that's 29 years, dated 29 years after it was written. So it's way closer, incredibly closer to the original. And just look at the massive volume of Greek text that we have, almost 6,000. That means they can take the Greek text, lay 6,000 of them out, and work through all of these things and these differences and these little pen marks and all, of, all that stuff and come down to a very confident conclusion about the original. And that's just the Greek text. If you add in copies in other languages, like Aramaic or Coptic or Latin, there's over 24,000 copies that we can use to compare content. And none of these variants in all of these as we keep finding more manuscripts. And you think, if you find more manuscripts, aren't you going to find more errors? Well, you find way fewer errors than you do confirm what the text actually says. And none of these affect any material issue or historical fact or doctrinal position. So when someone points this out, like, hey, where's verse 14 in your Bible? Or what about those 400,000 errors? You can just not have, don't be shaken. Don't let that shake your faith and confidence in the Bible. In fact, it should increase it. Look what God built into the transmission of his word. He, he, he gave us all of this manuscript evidence to give us full confidence that what we're reading and what we stake our lives on is genuine. It's straight from him. 